you being the man that I am, I had to start critically thinking again, and I said, all right, I have to go back and look at this, albeit I didn't want to. But I have a critically thinking mind. I am open-minded, number one. I'm open-minded enough to know that most of what I had been taught throughout my entire life is not really what it appears to be. So I'll tell you, I've been wrapped around this for about three months now, and I've been deeply involved in research. I've been deeply involved in mental experiments, thought projects, trying to go, wait a minute, something's wrong here. I can't say that I'm a flat earther yet, but I would say that I am a ball earth skeptic. And I'll tell you the biggest reason why. And we're going to talk to Mark Sargent here in a minute because his movie was fantastic and it really helped me with several things. The biggest reason that I had to look at this again is that nobody has ever circumnavigated the globe north to south. What are they hiding in Antarctica? What is going on down there? We're going to talk to uh, Mark Sargent about much of this and uh, even more. We're going to go down the rabbit hole here and we are going to explore a, a concept, an idea, a conspiracy theory that is even taboo in the conspiracy theory movement or in the truth movement. So when we come back, we're going to be talking to Mark Sargent. So stay tuned. This is going to be a good show. I would encourage people to call in if you have questions because this is, this is a great topic. So uh, we're going to be going ahead and taking a break here, and then we're going to be bringing up Mark Sargent, uh, the uh, maker of Flat Earth Clues. And welcome back to the Awakening Liberty Show with Sean Carone, me, your humble host right here on the FreedomizerRadio.com network. I want to send a special shout-out to some new listeners of mine and uh, the great barbecue that we had today, Myra and Joe, and the food was fabulous. I so much uh, just thank you from the bottom of my heart. That was a great experience. Uh, Myra, your food was outstanding, so uh, I'm, I'm definitely uh, very happy to have you listening to the show as well. That was That's great. So anyway, we're going to go ahead, and I'm going to bring up Mark Sargent here, and we're going to talk a little bit about this flat earth theory and uh, debate this whole thing a little bit. And uh, Mark, are you with us this evening? I am, Sean. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, thank you for being on the show, Mark. Uh, and thank you for your video. You know, Flat Earth Clues uh, really inspired me to start even looking at this again, and uh, cool. I really appreciate what you did. Um, oh, you're and really I, I apologize. I apologize for our direct connect. This is the third week in a row, and I find it funny. Every time I start talking about what I really believe is the truth, I seem to have all kinds of problems on Blog Talk Radio. This is a signature of the elite or the power structure. Something like that's going on here. So Yeah, funny how that happened. Uh, it's very true. I, I, you know, what makes me happy, though, is I'm not the only one experiencing I mean, people like John B. Wells are having it happen to them. Uh, so yeah. who knows what's going on here. It's obvious yeah. to me that they're actually listening. So yeah, you know, yeah, let's talk. Is. Let's 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 talk a little bit about this. All right. Um, let's like talk I said, I just want to look at this. <laughs> yeah, let's talk some flat Earth. You know, but, you know. Before I do that, I I want to give you the opportunity here because you are one of the premier people involved in this flat Earth truth movement, and okay. there are some other people involved in it as well. And and there's a lot of people bashing you. And I want to I want to give you the uh, opportunity to to. Uh, Tell us that, because uh, they're saying you work for the NSA, they're saying you're a shill, all this kind of stuff. Just uh, give us your take on that. And, uh, oh, tell us who sure. you really are. The, the, the three people that really started out in this thing uh, and really ramped up, there was, there was a guy that was doing it a long time ago, actually years ago. His name was Matt Boylan, uh, an artist out of Canada. He was the closest thing to, the whistle, to a whistleblower we had. And <clears throat> he basically said that, uh, that he had worked for NASA as a contract artist, as a photorealistic uh, artist. <clears throat> but when he was doing it, nobody was really listening to him. Excuse me one second. And then there was Eric Dubay, who had built a lot of his work off of Matt's stuff, uh, and he was doing it really kind of uh, late last year, early this year. And then I came out in the middle of February this year and did Flat Earth Clues and, went and really just kind of laid down the structure. It was really kind of like a... a um, uh, flat Earth for Dummies sort of thing. It wasn't very flashy in my opinion. It was just a narrative, some slideshow, and I, you know, I broke it down from A to Z. And I caught some flack from the Flat Earth movement, which was really amazing. Uh, Eric wanted me to follow his model exactly, 
And, uh, you know, he, he, and, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. You know, I said, look, you know, my model is slightly different from yours, but I, I think they're minor points. We should really just kind of move, move down the path. And Matt kind of wanted to guide me in a certain direction as well. Wanted to kind of steer me. And I said, look, I, I, I appreciate the input guys, but I'm going with my thing and, you know, I'll, I'll go it alone if I have to. And so, yeah, there was some discrediting that was thrown out there. No, no question. And I, I didn't blame them. You know, I was accused of, they didn't, didn't really specify an agency, you know, didn't say who I worked for, whether it be the FBI, CIA, NSA, whatever alphabet group you want. But they were, they were more or less trying to, to shoot me down, but there wasn't really much they could do. So uh, in the process, they ended up fighting between each other. And now I'm kind of, you know, pushing 30 interviews later. <laughs> I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm at the forefront of this thing. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm flattered. I'm humbled. But uh, look, all I really did was give an old idea some, uh, some new structure. And that's where we are now. Yeah, and the, as you said, flat Earth for dummies. I, you know, I, I love the way you did it. Obviously, I actually watched it in a full length because somebody had put all the clips together into a full length video. Um, yeah, the way I didn't you make did that. it initially. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, initially in your playlist, it was you know just short clips. I think they were you know ten, twelve minutes, something like that. So, yeah. and it wasn't it wasn't about all of the math. It wasn't about all the physics or the the concepts of of you know getting uh, animation programs and all this to going and. Yeah. yeah, the other guys have done that, um, but this actually sure. breaks it down with some very, very simple clues, and where you don't have to go that route. So I would encourage people to really go and watch it, and it's and it's available on your YouTube channel, right? Yep, it's available on YouTube channel. You can either uh, Google Flat Earth Clues or um, <clears throat> do it in uh, on. Uh, uh, YouTube, or you could just go to enclosedworld.com. Uh, I, in fact, I had to build a website for this because it was getting so much traction. I didn't even have a website up all the way until uh, April. And then I was like, ah, oh, crap, I, I got to do something here. So I started building a website, so it's out there as well. But yeah, the Flat Earth Clues, there's an introduction and 11 clues, so 12 total. They each run between, I don't know, 8 minutes and 12 minutes. Some are a little bit longer, some a little bit less. But, but yeah, they, what, what you're saying, they break it down into small digestible chunks. And I don't cover, I use no math when I'm, when I'm talking to stuff. I don't go over the curvature. I don't go over the Coriolis effect. I don't talk about the physics of gravity. Uh, it's really the broad strokes is what I was going for. You know, the stuff that really makes you scratch your head. And by the time I was done, I mean, heck, by the time I was at like clue four, I realized there was no turning back. That This thing was actually, you know, initially I had put out you know, back in the early February, I really structured a question and I put it out to the internet or the internet hive mind, as I like to call it. And I said, look, I don't think it's a globe. Tell me how you know it's a globe. And I thought for sure, because, you know, the, the internet is a smart, smart place, you know, the combined intelligence of, of what's out there. Nobody came back and proved it. In fact, it got worse where more people were asking, yeah, yeah, wait, 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 how do you know it's a globe? And uh, to the point now, here we are in July, you know, almost into August, and, and it still hasn't been answered, which is it's amazing. I mean, this thing is for real. It's, you know, the, the most laughable conspiracy of all time may turn out to be the one that changes it all. Yeah, I, I'm starting to really agree with you. And like I said, I didn't really want to look at this, but claiming to be who I am, which is being open-minded, always a student, I had to look at this. And by the way, for you archive listeners uh, on Blog Talk Radio, you will see that the link in the uh, in the description field below, Flat Earth Clues. Just click right on that; it will take you right to uh, Mark's uh, video. So go ahead and watch that. So, um, I, you know what? I, the first thing I want to talk about is a little bit about NASA. Sure. And we obviously know, I, and I think you have to wrap your head around NASA before you can actually open your mind up enough to look at the plausibility or possibility of a flat Earth. So yeah. tell us a little bit about NASA and who these people really are and what have they been doing? I mean, are they lying to us completely? NASA has been, and, and you can find you know, various, I mean, yeah, we, we all know that the moon missions, the Apollo missions have been in, in question for a long, long time, you know, ever since they were, they were fired up in, in the 60s. But through my research, I have pretty much determined that NASA is an absolute fraud from day one. As a matter of fact, even before they were created, uh, you know, they went online in 1958, and right, right after they were doing the high altitude uh, atomic tests, uh, you know, between Russia and America, you know, they went online in 1958. And I believe 
full well, yeah, w without any doubt in my mind, that they were created as a part of the process to, to keep this thing hidden from us. To keep, if you want to call it a Truman Show, if you want to call it an enclosed structure, if you want to call it, you know, the firmament, you know, take your pick. But they were designed specifically to militarize space and to keep it from us. And for those people who, who still don't understand, if they think that NASA is just this benign Starfleet, Star Trek uh, organization that's all about science and peace and love, no, no, no. It's, it's a military wing of the United States uh, government. It, is, it was formed on military technology. Uh, in fact, it's the only group that was formed. I mean, it was literally built on missile technology. And uh, once they started up in 1958, everything ramped up really, really quickly. So, you know, they were the ones that announced the Van Allen radiation belts in 1959. Then they started, you know, the Mercury program, the Gemini program. And then when the Apollo program came online, I mean, uh, look, look up, people want to have fun. Look up when uh, the, the rumors that NASA hired Stanley Kubrick and, you know, let him, you know, gave him five years and an unlimited budget to see what he could create, what he could simulate in film uh, about space, about space travel. And then 1968, a year before Apollo came out, 2001, a space odyssey, you know, no coincidence there. Then 1969 through 1972, <clears throat> they, uh, you know, supposedly launched, you know, Apollo 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, right? Supposedly did all these, these missions, manned missions, supposedly went round trips through the Van Allen radiation belts. That's twice. Round trips through the deadliest thing ever known, you know, announced in 1959 that it, absolutely any humans that went into it would, would die without any shielding. And when they came back, you know, nobody had cancer, nobody had radiation poisoning, the capsules weren't contaminated to, to, to and all these things. And then, um, and then they just kept, they kept, perp I'm sorry, um, kept continuing the lie all the way through the space shuttle program and the space and the you know skylab and the and the whole night to the point now where you know the ISS is is just a joke. Yeah, there's uh, so many questions involved with what NASA has done and and you mentioned the high altitude nuclear testing which was operation fishbowl and we're going to get into that a little bit when we talk about Admiral Byrd. I want to make yeah. a comment about NASA. From what I see, NASA is probably the whole, all the money that has been spent, all the taxpayer dollars that have been spent, it seems to me it's got to be the biggest heist in world history. Yeah. It doesn't seem yeah. like we're getting anything for our money except what NASA now stands for, in my opinion, is never a straight answer. <laughs> Something is yeah. going wrong at NASA, and there's too many coincidences that just strange things. And, and you mentioned something about the, the radiation belts. I, I want to play a clip, if you don't mind. It's about two no, and a half ahead. minutes of sure. Alan Bean, who was on Apollo 12. He was uh, the fourth man to allegedly walk on the moon. And talking about the radiation belts, um, I just found this very, very interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and play this clip. Bear with us. It's about two minutes and 28 seconds long. Again, Alan Bean, the fourth man to walk on the moon, who flew through the radiation belts. Any ill effects from the Van Allen radiation belts? No. Now, I'm not sure we went far enough out to, to encounter the Van Allen radiation belt. Maybe we did. When it was pointed out that the flight pattern took him through the belts, he changed his story. The belts are 1,000 miles to 25,000 miles above then, the Earth. We, then we went right out through them. No effects on your cells? Mm -hmm. We didn't even know it. I don't think anybody, well, maybe somebody said you went through the radiation belt, but we didn't feel it inside, and we didn't get any you know, added radiation. The space shuttle went to 365 miles a few years ago uh -huh. because I worked in news. Uh -huh. I saw CNN, they said that the radiation belts surrounding Earth were more dangerous than previously believed because the astronauts saw shooting stars with their eyes closed oh, just man. when they that got within 600. Radiation belt. We saw shooting stars, but they're not shooting stars from with your eyes closed, although they look like it. Uh, if you're out in space beyond the Van Allen belt, and probably within the Van Allen belt, and close your eyes and just pay attention. You don't notice it unless you pay attention. Then all of a sudden you'll see a little flash like a shooting star, except it's like that. There goes one this way. Then one just blossoms. And then not that fast. Maybe you wait three minutes or two minutes and one goes whoosh. And what's happening is cosmic rays are hitting the uh, back of your eye 
and exciting those sensors in the back of your eye. So that's what you see. And they got high enough apparently to close them. My guess is in Earth orbit, if you closed your eyes and just paid attention, that you would see them. The first time they were seen was when they went to 365 miles. Yes. That's 650 miles below or away from the radiation. Yeah, see, it, it's below. My guess if they just did it tonight. But see, if you're not, if you're just going to sleep or closing your eyes or it's dark, you don't notice them. But if you'll close your eyes and pay attention, which we had an experiment to do, by the way, then you see them whistling by. Not on our mission, by the way, they hadn't been discovered yet. It hadn't been discovered yet. It hadn't been discovered yet. It hadn't been discovered yet. Now, do I detect a uh, whole load of BS in that interview? What do you think, Mark? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That's an expert. I, I know that, uh, that one well. That's an excerpt from uh, uh, Astronauts Gone Wild when uh, they were try he was trying to ambush the, um, the astronauts and, 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 and trip them up on, with questions, and he did. He, he nailed them on that one because, yeah, he said that, oh, yeah, they, they must not have been uh, you know, discovered yet, which was a bunch of crap. It was discovered in 1959. That in fact, NASA was the ones that uh, were the ones that announced it. So yeah, no, the astronauts were you know the Apollo astronauts. They were briefed about as well as they could. But unfortunately, you know, if you do enough interviews, and some of them avoided it over time, they're they're going to trip up. And that was that was a perfect example of it. I mean, the fact that that one of the astronauts wouldn't know exactly. Not only would he not know if he passed through the ventilated radiation belts, but he didn't even know when they were discovered. Oh yeah. Yeah, bunch of crap. Yeah, that, that 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 interview just blew me away, and the whole astronauts gone wild thing is just bizarre to me. And I, you know, yeah. the interviewer, you can hear when he starts to put him on the spot. If you know anything about the astronauts gone wild, I mean, it it, it resulted in at least one fist fight, uh, yeah. and uh, I believe with was it Buzz Aldrin that actually threw a punch at the, at the guy. You can actually hear the interviewer's voice crack a little bit during this when he starts to put Alan Bean on the spot. And I, I found that kind of funny. And then this, this BS starts uh, just over and over again. Um, so, yeah, that's, a, that, that's some amazing stuff. And then is there any truth? Uh, and I've had some conflicting things about uh, Chernobyl and the fact that the Soviet Union actually asked the American government after Chernobyl that we could, it, they asked them, they said, can we use the spacesuits that you flew through the Van Allen radiation belts with and went to the moon in, in the heavy radiation to actually help clean up the uh, Chernobyl accident? And, uh, the, you know, America said, yeah, basically you, know, you can use them, but there's no radiation shielding in them. There's nothing in them that will protect you from that. Is, is there any truth to that? Oh yeah, yeah. There's no, no. There's no radiation shielding at all in anything. We we we've, we've known this for the longest time. And again, that was the problem when they announced. Again, it seemed like a great idea at the time, announcing the Van Allen radiation belts in 959. But only later, you know, and they had 10 years to figure out a, a way around this. Only later, because we didn't know anything about radiation back then, did they figure out that there's only two elements, common elements that we you can use to protect yourself from radiation. One is lead. You know, that big blanket we get put on us when we go to the dentist's office. And the other one is gold, uh, you know, because gold is twice as dense as lead. Most people don't know that. But you can't put lead or you can't put heavy, heavy material like that in anything because, it, you know, it weighs you down. It, if you put it on an astronaut, you know, he might as well be deep sea diving. If you put it on, if you put it on top of a capsule, you, you, at that point, you're flying an anchor. So no, no, there's no shielding to speak of and on anything. It's all it's all lies, all of it. There's no, there are no astronauts that are put on the top of rockets. I'll I'll even go, and if this gets gets phone calls, that's fine. No astronauts sit on top of rockets. Uh, if anyone has any doubts, look up a, a what, some wonderful YouTube videos and web pages uh, that say the Challenger astronauts are still alive, for the you know from the Challenger disaster in 1986. I've seen you that. Look at these. Yeah, you can look at these pictures. I mean, two of these people supposedly have twin brothers, you know. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, that stuff blows me away, too. So, so now that we've kind of determined that NASA is full of you-know-what, and basically yeah. they've been feeding us a line of crap, um, yeah. we're going to get into the reasons why they were doing that. But I want to, I want to jump over and talk a little bit about Admiral Byrd. Um, sure. And you mentioned the high altitude nuclear testing, Operation yeah. Fis Fishball. There was Operation yeah. Deep Freeze and Operation High Jump, which was in between the two, actually. So tell yeah. us a little bit about Admiral Byrd, who he was, and what he was doing in the Antarctica in the 50s. 
Admiral Byrd, what most people will know him from the Hollow Earth theory. And that was, and that's all really anybody knows about him until I started doing my, my research on this, which was Admiral Byrd in 1926 flew a pretty rickety plane up to the North Pole. And if you believe his secret diaries, said that there was an opening at the North Pole, with, which led into a giant cavernous chamber where there were civilizations and animals, you know, a journey to the center of the earth type thing. But what most people don't know is that after 1926, specifically starting in 1928, the governments of whoever was controlling them, you know, if you want to say it was the American government, that's fine. Admiral Byrd, by the way, was the youngest admiral in the United States Navy of all time. He made admiral at age 41, which is astounding. But they sent him down to the South Pole, and that's where he spent pretty much the rest of his life, all the way to his dying day from 1928 until 1957, that's when he died, um, <clears throat> looking for something in the South Pole. And it was mission after mission, and then um, he didn't do any missions during World War II and, you know, down the South Pole, although if you want to look at some interesting stuff, there was one group who did do a lot of missions during World War II, and, and that was Nazi Germany. And, and then af, right after World War II in 1956, he went down, uh, I'm sorry, 1946, he went down to uh, do Operation High Jump, which again is an interesting name, where he took a full-blown carrier fleet, you know, complete complement, you know, thousands of men, and he had to deal with something. But whatever happened down there, they've got that one, you know, whatever that mission happened during that mission was, was really, really tight under wraps. So... After that, he kept doing more missions in the late 40s and early 50s. And then in 1954, it appeared that whatever he was looking for, he had stopped looking. Uh, you know, and if you want to take your pick on, on which authority, you know, the Illuminati, the Bilderbergers, the Masons, whoever was directing them, even they, I think, had given up. So because in 1954, he goes on television, on national television, on CBS, and you can look this up online. It's a, it's a great find. I'm so glad somebody released it. He goes on television in 1954 and says, oh, yeah, by the way, Antarctica is pretty much made out of money, and a lot of countries are interested, including Russia and America and uh, England and Australia. The whole, you know, everyone that, that could be somebody was down there, and we're going to make money. You know, there's coal, there's oil, there's minerals, there's uranium. And there's nothing to worry about because there's no plant life, there's no animal life, who, who cares, right? And then he goes down the very next year for Operation Deep Freeze in 1955 to 1956. And whatever, that's when the world changed. If you want to know a pivotal year in history, that's when it all changed. Because whatever they found down there, and I, I have no doubt what they found, uh, whatever they found down there scared them to such a degree that all the countries left the ice at the same time and they put an iron cloud tr ironclad treaty in place in 1959 called the Antarctic Treaty, which forbids any corporation from any country in the world from doing any resource work down there forever. It, it is still in place today. If, you, if anyone knows of a treaty that has lasted longer, that, is, that has involved more nations, it, and 10 nations signed on, uh, in 1959, and every country that becomes economically, um, economically viable has to sign on to this treaty. It's not even up for debate until 2041. And when I saw that, it was like, okay, that's, that's where we've got a problem, because what conspiracy is bigger than money? I mean, everybody knows that money and power and greed rule the world, but this was bigger than that. They couldn't come up with a cover story. I mean, there's literally, you guys can look, this is not secret information. You look up online... And you, uh, you see uh, that um, – uh, crap, lost my train of thought uh, – you, that the Antarctic Defense Force exists. There's actually such a thing. It's a multinational, highly militarized, um, state-of-the-art weaponry that protects the Antarctic. From what? What are you protecting exactly? There's no there's nobody yeah, yeah. down there. Everything I've read is it's guarded much like Area 51 would be. Uh, the, obviously, the 99 percenters, we can't just go down to Antarctica without an escort. They can only be approached from three different places on the planet. Um, and, and you're actually escorted out there. You can only go to the islands, so you can't actually get to the continent, quote-unquote, yeah. of Antarctica. Um, something really raised some red flags for me with that, too. And the other thing is, Mark, why in the world, when they tell us they sent a man to the moon with technology yeah. less sophisticated than your cell phone, Yep. That we cannot circumnavigate the globe north to south yep. in an airplane or even, even in a ship. Why has yep. that never been done? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of those things that's been swept under the rug for years and years. Everybody knows that you have bored millionaires and billionaires that love to traverse you know, the, the world every which way but loose. 
And you're telling me that nobody in, in either a ship or a plane or a hot air balloon or whatever you want, and I know the, the weather systems go from east to west, so a balloon's not practical. But yeah, nobody circumnavigated uh, north to south. Nobody talks about it. It's, uh, it's one, it is the best kept secret in the world. And that is, you know, if you guys want me to boil it down for you, there's something wrong in the southern hemisphere. More specifically, there's something wrong with Antarctica, and they have hidden it forever from everybody. You know, yeah, you can spend ten, twelve thousand $12,000 and get to the peninsula off, off Chile and take your picture with penguins. But that's it. Other than that, you cannot go in the interior without severe amounts of permits. There's layers of treaties now involved. And there's a high amount of, of military. But more importantly than that, it's like, why? Here, here's the part that bugged me more than anything. And that was corporations, we'll, we'll just pick on the petroleum industry because it's easy. Look, they, if they want to get into your backyard and start fracking, they can do it, right? They've got a high degree of, uh, you know, unless the entire town decides to go mm-hmm. against them, they are going to get in your backyard and, and go fracking. But you're telling me this same corporation, even though there's nothing, con- you know, there's no uh, uh, conflicting forces out there, they not, not only are they not allowed to drill or in Antarctica, they're not even allowed to talk about it. They're not even allowed to petition it. When does that happen? You know, you, you, you'd think they would just lobby the, the hell out of Congress, you know, or, or whatever politicians they had to, and, and then put, put out some stories saying why it would be good for America if we were drilling, you know, for oil in Antarctica. But no, they're not even allowed to talk about it. And it's just mind-blowing that it has been missed for so long. Yeah, and is it, isn't it true that all the nations that are in the Antarctic Treaty, which was signed in 1958, correct? 59. Uh, obviously. 59. And obviously yeah. after Operation Fishbowl, um, are, are all, these, all these nations all have their own space programs, do they not? A lot of them do, yeah. It's, it's one of the, it's a funny thing is, yeah, you've got your European Space Agency, uh, JAXA, which, which is the Japan Space Agency, China, Russia, India, uh, and the United States. So really five or six main ones because, the, you know, it still takes a lot of money. To, you know, right. if you're going to fake something like that. But yeah, they're all in on it because NASA was the one that started it. So they all go through NASA. Uh, they get all their instructions, all the blueprints go through NASA. NASA knows exactly what they're doing. And NASA is the one that trains them. It's like, look, you want to fake a space program? Here's how you do it. I mean, most people don't even know that supposedly, you know, like, like the United States supposedly has a Mars rover, you know, that's still broadcasting pictures. Most people don't know. They, people know that. But they don't know that China supposedly has a rover on the moon right now. That would, it landed in 2013, supposedly taking all sorts of pictures. Nobody's seeing them. Uh, or, or the Japan sent HD cameras supposedly around the moon uh, like five, six years ago through the JAXA program. No, you know, those pictures, you see American media covering that? Nope. I mean, they're, yeah, they're all in on it. It is, it is the greatest con of all time, the greatest trick of all time. And, uh, and again, it was, it was, um, the, the, it's, it's the one that everybody fell for, including it doesn't matter how rich or powerful you are. Most of the, you know, I'm sure there was some people at the high, high levels that knew, but you know, most people, uh, you know, it, they, they fell for it. Why, why wouldn't they? We were indoctrinated well, since children. Hook, yeah. line, and sinker. So. I mean, I've been buying it for the longest time, and part of that was for me was all the science fiction and and you know Star Trek and Star Wars and and 2001: A Space Odyssey. I mean, I'm hook, line, and sinker. I think oh, this is the coolest thing. And you know, one of the things though, as I have grown more spiritual and gotten closer to God, and what I know is going on in the world by this authority that is guarding Antarctica as I have realized what these people are doing, which is try to separate everybody from God. Um, what did, I, I'm just going to be flat out here. What do you think they found? Do you think they found the edge? I think, that, I think they found the edge. It, because it, whatever it was was so big, it, physically large, that they couldn't come up with a cover story for it. That was the, the big thing. Because, uh, for example, Area 51, you can hide Area 51. You know, just put up a whole bunch of fences with scary signs and guys driving around in black trucks. You can hide a, a small chunk of Nevada, but this thing was so big, they had to hide the entire continent. They had to keep everybody out entirely. So, yeah, I think, uh, again, it, you know, depending on which way you want to look at it, I think the edge or the barrier or the firmament. Now, whether it's permeable, whether you can pass through it, you know, whether it's made out of energy or a, high, a heavy element or a heavy wa- a water, we don't know. But 
what I think is they found it was so big that they fit that they figured out the corporations, they couldn't allow the corporations in there because eventually you wouldn't, if somebody made a mistake, like say you had a helicopter that went off course, well, if that helicopter got anywhere close to this thing, you'd have to take care of those guys. So they said, you know what, we're not even going to deal with it. This is not worth the money that, that the corporations could make. Therefore, that's why they sealed it off. So yeah, I, I think they were looking for the edge for 30 years and Admiral Byrd, I believe, found it and then shared it with the Russians, or, or the Russians could have been in on it, because at the, here's, here's, the, here's the big kicker. Right after that happened, right after Operation Deep Freeze happened, the Russians and the Americans were hell-bent on getting their rocket program up and running. Because remember, the space program didn't even exist. I mean the rocket program. They built rockets like their lives depended on it, and then within a year after the rocket program was up and running, that's when they put uh, um, uh, nuclear weapons on the top of them, and started firing them straight up, both the, um, the Russians and the Americans, because they were the only two groups that could do it. And they fired the test pretty much straight up for four years. And you got to wonder why. And, uh, you know, if you look at the shots and it's public, you know, public information, you can look them up, part of uh, Operation Fishbowl and Operation Hardtack, and then the Russian equivalents, uh, they, were, they were mapping out the sky. There was no doubt in my mind. They tried to break through it in 1958 with some heavy mega, megaton shots. And then after that, they just, you know, it was low kiloton or, or high kiloton shots from that point forward. And they were just trying to map out the sky to, to figure out exactly the shape of this thing. So, yeah, uh, the Russians, the Americans, it, it, been, they've been buddies the entire time. Yeah, and my, that's my speculation, too. That, uh, you know, they, Operation High Jump, so they may have found a wall. Because some people will say, well, why don't we fall off the edge? Well, apparently from what Admiral Byrd said, is there's, a, there's a, a wall of ice that they kept running oh, into, um, a huge yeah, wall the, of ice. Yeah, uh, the Antarctica is the most unique continent of any of the continents uh, that we have. Most people, again, don't understand that it, yeah, the water does not fall off the edge. One, because Antarctica slopes up 200 feet, almost straight up, along the entire edge of the continent. That's just the first part of two, you know, 200 feet. That's, you know, that's if you're trying to get to the beach. And then once you get on top of that thing, then you have it slopes upwards to two miles, you know, pushing 10,000 feet, and then it plateaus off. Most of the continent is at 10,000 feet or higher. And then there are certain mountain ranges here and there, but it is an extremely hostile place where, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands of, of uh, well, actually millions of square miles of just ice and snow. Uh, it, was there a point where they couldn't get past it? Yeah, that's, that's what we're trying to figure out. Is it an ice wall? Yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, I'd like to think it would be a little more advanced than an ice wall, but then you never know. It's, uh, it's yeah. yeah, it stopped them. It stopped them dead in their tracks. That's I have no doubt. It, it certainly sounds like a fence, and then you have Operation High Jump, which sounds uh, kind of funny. They're trying to get over something, and then you have yeah. Operation Fishbowl, and they're going, all right, we can't get out of it this way, so we're gonna we're gonna launch some uh, high altitude nuclear testing into the into the fishbowl. The fact that it's called fishbowl truly raised some questions for me as oh, well. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. That, that, that's the best name they could come up with, yeah. <laughs> and that, that just blows me away. So that's bird. That's, uh, you know, people need to know about this whole Antarctica Treaty and the fact that we've never circumnavigated the globe. Nobody's done it. Yep. You know, north to south, 360 around, nobody's ever done it. So yep. when we come back um, from the break, I want to talk a little bit about the azimuth equidistant map and how it associates sure. with the UN and the USGS. And we're going to give a little bit of history about that. And then uh, later on in the show, we're going to talk about the models and uh, how this actually works. And I've actually got some questions for you. Uh, sure. I, you know, so I'm, I, there's things I can't rectify yet, but I'm, I'm working on it. And uh, I tell you, I'm, I'm uh, definitely a globe skeptic at this point. So if you would like to call into the show and talk to Mark, ask him any questions. I know this is a hot topic. This is a taboo topic. Please do call in. We're going to open the phone lines up probably, uh, oh, 20 till 8 or so. And uh, so feel free to call in 347-324-3704, 347-324-3704. And we will be back here very shortly with Mark Sargent. Nobody has a monopoly on what is a very hard problem. But I don't have much patience for anyone who denies that this challenge is real. We don't have time for a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. <laughs> Sticking your head in the sand might make you feel safer, but it's not going to protect you from the coming storm. 
And ultimately, we will be judged as a people and as a society and as a country on where we go from here. Our founders believed that those of us in positions of power are elected not just to serve as custodians of the present, but as caretakers of the future. And they charged us to make decisions with an eye on a longer horizon than the arc of our own political careers. That's what the American people expect. Well, welcome back to the Awakening Liberty Show. You know, I came across that clip, and in much of my research in the truth movement, yeah. it seems to me that there is more truth the more resistance there is. So, you know, the fact that he is mentioning Flat Earth Society at such a high level tells me that... Uh, they're concerned that people are starting to figure something out. And I also noticed, and I don't know if you noticed this or not, because I know you've heard this clip, Mark. Yeah. If, if you notice there towards the end, he was talking about a custodian of the present and, and uh, the caretakers of the future, which is not what the Founding Fathers intended. They, they were supposed to serve in a very short period of time and take care of business the way it was supposed to be taken care of. He yeah. said three words in the following sentences, which was I, horizon, an arc, which I found very, very telling. Um, and maybe it's just a coincidence, but I've seen this in other speeches where they say things almost hidden in plain sight, the eye obviously being the eye of Horus or the, the all-seeing eye. He's talking about horizon. He's talking about an arc. Um, you know, why was it written that way? Do, do, you, do you see that? I mean, this is what yeah, I thought. Well, no, I'm, that's the, you, you're good because I, I didn't catch that, and I've watched that clip probably 100 times. Uh, I, I didn't, you're right. That's the it's good point. And, and, but more to your, uh, your opening statement on that people, yeah, people don't understand. It's like, look, that wasn't an off the cuff remark. Nothing that he says is off the cuff. That was written in the speech. And it was spooky for me because I didn't see that clip until after I had made the clues. And then I realized he had made them six months before I had even made the clues. So it's like they were anticipating this thing coming down the road, which was, which was eerie eerie to me uh so yeah 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 fascinating stuff yeah and they are concerned no question uh if anyone has any doubt look at the nasa picture that was released on uh this last monday you know the first one and they were so they were so blatant about it where they said look this is the first nasa uh first full picture of the earth we've released in 45 years or 43 years and you know the first one was in 1972 and it, this was something that the flat earth movement had been harping on for months and that is look you want to prove you know, prove it to me it's a globe there's only one picture of the earth from space why and then all of a sudden nasa comes out and it's like okay now we have two pictures of the earth from space and, and their timing the timing of it was really spooky because you know it just it, it was too perfect is what, what i'm getting at so yeah uh, mark i i have to tell you again and we're talking about what i think is the truth and it seems to me that we we're on target while you were speaking i could actually hear you my wife's got uh, the laptop in the other room but my phone completely went dead um oh i didn't i didn't even know <laughs> it completely it, it blog talk radio completely cut me off although my phone was still connected um uh, it, again these strange things these little electronic signatures that the authority is is throwing in on us so i didn't uh, i didn't hear everything you said but i'm i'm sure everything was awesome was and made complete sense it was great <laughs> well i'm going to hear it in the archives so that's going to be awesome so let's talk <laughs> a little bit about uh uh, this never ceases to amaze me. Every time I get on target, it seems like they're 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 always after us. Um, That's okay. I didn't talk... I didn't see a beat. Go ahead. <laughs> the uh, the the UN. Okay. Um, and the USGS. Now, there's several maps that we have all been exposed to. We have been exposed yeah. to uh, the globe model. We've been exposed to the, the 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 planet model where everything is widened out. Um, there's the Gall Peters map, I believe. And yeah. there's the uh, asm is is called what is it the azimuthal or the equidistant? Uh, it's either it's either the azimuthal or azimuthal, depending on how you want to pronounce it. I just call it the AE map at this point. Uh, you know, it's it's the AE projection, which is part of the USGS. I'm sorry, USGS, which is the United States Geological Survey. Uh, the United, basically, the map makers of the world, and it's part of their catalog. And what it is is a top-down view of the world, as if you squish the globe into the floor and you made the North Pole the center of the map, a center of a circular map, and then all the continents were kind of spread on the outside. And then Antarctica, because Antarctica, you know, is, is literally the bottom of a globe, has to be stretched out around the entire edge of the map 
coincidentally, like a giant wall of ice. And that map was really, really interesting when I was looking at it. I, I honestly, when I was looking at it, I was going, yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool. You know, what was interesting, though, was two things. One was that it was identical to the Flat Earth map. So the Flat Earth map uses the same AE map, only the Flat Earth map is considered crazy because the Flat Earth map is supposed to be literal, where the AE map is more just a projection. You know, they say, well, it's still a globe, but if you made it flat, here's what it would look like. The other thing that was interesting about it was who created the design of it, because I thought it was a typo. The creator of it, in the short version of his name, because uh, he's Persian, not, well, he was Persian, it's now Iran, uh, which was a guy named Al Biruni, B-I-R-U-N-I. And he was a Persian scientist that lived about a thousand years ago when the earth was flat. I mean, most people, you know, keep forgetting that up until 500 years ago, all the cultures of the world, all the governments, all the religions, all believed that the earth was flat. And the religions still stuck to it because, you know, religions don't necessarily change, but they had to adopt the globe because, uh, you know, there was too much pressure coming from science and, and governments. So Al Biruni supposedly made, helped make this map. I was going, oh, that's kind of strange. I go, well, maybe it's a typo. And then I look up and I found out that NASA had actually named a moon crater after him, the Al Biruni crater. I was going, wow, that's, another, again, another really, really strange thing. And then if you want to throw one more thing to the mix, and this is the big one because we've all seen it, and that is the Flat Earth map and the AE map are exactly identical to the UN flag which was adopted in 1946 before they found the, the, the edge, but during uh, Operation High Jump, which meant that the UN and the secret societies that control it, they already knew in advance. You know, they had the old maps, of course. You know, they, they knew you know, a long, long time ago, but it doesn't do anybody any good if you don't have the technology to exploit it. So if you're the king of France in 1500 and you have a map, like an AE map, and you, and you know it's real, What's, what good is it going to do you? Without you know, metal ships and internal combustion engines, you're not going to be able to do anything. Basically, without airplanes, you're not going to be able to do anything. So the UN flag was adopted in 1946, you know, the final version of it, and it is literally identical to the AE map and the flat earth map with one very obvious uh, omission, which is there is no Antarctica on the UN flag. And I thought that was also really, really odd. Because, and Matt Boylan talked about this in, uh, in his video, you know, because he, he picked up on it right away when he saw it. He was like, because where's Antarctica? Antarctica isn't even represented unless you want to count the giant, you know, uh, Roman reefs that, you know, the yeah, spiky the, the reef reefs. around it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but the thing is, that, and, and you have to assume that because the UN doesn't address it. They don't say that Antarctica is the reefs. You just have to pretty much go along with that. Uh, but yeah, between the three of them, it's really, really unusual because why would the UN flag use the flat earth map? Why would the, the USGS use the flat earth map as part of their catalog? And why is the flat earth map, which is identical to two, these two things, not cross-referenced in any wiki, and it's considered absolutely insane. It's considered absolutely crazy. And, and I was looking at the same thing, and, and, and you know, as I'm staring at more and more of this stuff, and I know anyone that's listening that, you know, look... I absolutely thought this thing was the most insane thing I've ever heard of. It was, it was ridiculous and ludicrous and total insanity. And then, but unfortunately, I could not prove the globe. That's what, you know, I, I just kept trying to prove it and trying to prove it to the point where everything was stacking up on the flat side and the globe side, which should have 500 years of science and evidence and tens of thousands of pictures and, you know, all sorts of wonderful calculations – it would just wasn't holding up to the other side. So, yeah, so that's why I'm flat at this point. Yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at now as I'm trying to figure out, you know, how NASA hasn't shown me anything um, other no. than it seems like CGI pictures. And as you said, China is supposed to have a, a lunar rover on the moon right yeah. now. Why don't they turn it and point it at the Earth so we can actually see some real pictures? Uh, oh, oh, you know, better, better yet, why, why not drive, drive it to the Sea of Tranquility? Why not land it next to where our stuff is? I mean, talk about your, your, your great stuff as far as Chinese superiority. You could drive it right next to the American flag, take a picture next to it, and say, we're the only ones that are here now. No, they're, they're not even, no, they can't touch it because those vehicles don't exist. All those, ro those vehicles, all the moon buggies, the flags, everything out there, they're not there. The moon is not what you think it is. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in tendency to agree with you there, and I'm, I'm, I've had issues. You know, I interviewed Crow 777, and we were talking about the lunar wave, which 
Oh yeah. You know, I'm a yeah. video. I'm a video expert. I can't explain that. And the fact that it's been verified uh, by several other people around the world, they've they've uh, videotaped the same anomaly. You know, tell, some, something isn't right with that. And, yeah, I agree. Uh, it, you know who 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 knows what they're really doing. We're gonna actually we're gonna do a little speculating at the end of the show here. You made a great <laughs> comment. You were talking about the flat Earth model. Up until four or five hundred years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat, yeah. and especially in antiquity. And and when I go to the antiquity side of this, there are civilizations in our past who built things who were obviously very advanced, technological. They had obviously excellent, excellent building skills. They had mathematics. They had all kinds of stuff. And, in fact, they built things that we can't build today. We don't even know how they did it. Yet yeah. these people all knew that the world was flat. So yeah. all of a sudden, you know, four or 500 years ago, they decide, well, no, it's not. And, I mean, can you give, give me an idea what you think why they would tell us that? Why? What, what do you think they're I, trying to pull here? I think it was partly. I don't think it was just the authority. And by the authority, I'm talking about governments, the super rich, and the royals. You know, you know, you combine those into one group. I call them the authority. But I don't think I, I'll give the authority some credit, but I don't give them that much credit because 500 years ago, I think it was part of the building process itself. I think that whoever built this place, if you want to call it a giant planetarium crossed with a terrarium crossed with whatever, I think that they were the ones that artificially put that idea into certain scientists' heads and said, or, you know, you know let's, let's go with the globe model. Because what the globe gives you, what the globe gives you is so unique. What it does is it gets rid of, remember, if, if it's flat all the way up until 500 years ago, that means there an, there's an edge. And you give people enough time, they're going to start looking for that edge. So you tell people there's a globe, all of a sudden the edge vanishes. There is no edge. You're on a ball. Uh, the fence literally becomes invisible. And, you, you know, logic says, well, you can run around a globe all you want, and you're never, ever going to find an edge because it's a sphere. So it, it buys you time. And really, the most interesting stuff that's happened to our civilization has happened in the last 500 years, and it worked like a, cham like a charm. But what I think was different here is that I think naturally we were going to find it eventually anyway. Unfortunately, the people that found it were the authority or the government or, who, you know, in this case, the Russians, the Americans, and they had a decision to make. And that was, okay, and, and this, this is the, the question I pose to people out there. I say, look, up until 1957, you could not prove whether it was a globe or not. Let's say in 1957 you found out that it wasn't. Would you tell the public? And they had, you know, their, their decision, I think they made it fairly quickly, and they said, you know what, it would be too much of a disruption to society. Uh, it, would, it, would do, it would change religion. It would change the power structure. It would change a lot of stuff. So they said, you know what, let's, it's only money. Let's see how long we can hold on to this thing. And they held on to it for pff, the better part of 60 years. So there you have it. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting take on it. I, I actually take it just a little bit of a step further because these sure. people who are running the world, as far as I'm concerned, are Luciferian. Uh, these are they're psychopaths. Uh, they're wearing the satanic matrix of some sort, and they seem to be serving the satanic matrix. And yeah. it wasn't so much that they were concerned about what it would do to people. In fact, I, I think they've probably known this for a lot longer when we talk about secret societies and them guarding the ancient secrets, that they yeah. actually said, all right, wait a minute, we cannot let the people know this Number one, this is what I'm thinking, is that yeah. it would provide evidence of intelligent design, which we're talking about the creators, we're talking about God, we're talking yep. about the Most High God, yep. and that would change everything. They would lose their entire control structure. They would lose everything that they have built in trying to get people to separate themselves from God, disconnect themselves from God, to uh, partake in debauchery, to partake in what we see going on in the entertainment industry, that they can have wars and killings. It seems all satanic to me what they're doing in this, whatever we want to call it, a reality, but it seems yeah. to me like that's what they were trying to hide was evidence of God. Would you agree? I do agree. Uh, and I, I touched on that in, uh, in Clue 10, which was literally called Hiding God, which was, yes, yeah, from a religious standpoint, it is it would change us in, in so many ways right away. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of comments that, that I've seen people say, well, what would it matter whether it was a sphere, uh, you know, or whether it was round or if it was flat? I said, are you kidding me? I go, you may not care, but 
the, the five major religions of the world, uh, you know, um, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Islam, and Christianity, that make up about 80% of the population, they would all immediately uh, uh, catalyze uh, into, not necessarily into a universal group, but they would all have the same goal, and that is let us find proof of the Creator. Let us find proof of the divine. And if that means we have to go out and build a church on the ice so that we can see the handprint of God, they're going to do it. And yeah, you're right. The, the powers that be, even though I think it would take, you know, I think they could recover uh, after a while. It would probably take 10, 20, 30 years, whatever. Uh, yeah, they did not want to go down that road. You know, they do not take chances when it comes to something like that. And, and so they didn't. It, but yeah, it, absolutely, it's proof of intelligent design. Uh, you know, it, some people say, you know, it, it's the divine. Some people, you know, would say, well, maybe God subcontracted it out to a higher, you know, higher species. Hard to say, but I'm good, you know, it wouldn't really matter because all the churches would immediately think divine. So that's the path you're going to have to go down anyway and deal with. Uh, it, would, it would be awe-inspiring. It would be, it'd be the greatest event in our civilization's history. Uh, it would it, be unparalleled in, in scope. Yeah, because it seems like this whole globe model, this heliocentric uh, universe model that they have all convinced us is real, uh, it, it seems to me that their, their goal was to uh, make us this random occurrence in this vast universe and we're an average people, an average planet, and there's tons and more of them. So it takes, the, I guess, the specialness of who we are yeah, and the fact that yeah. we're children of God. To me, that's what I was just going, wow. Because, I mean, if we all of a sudden realize, yeah, there is a creator up there, there is something to this, and we all know it, I think. We all feel it. I know. Yeah. I feel it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it seems like that's what they just wanted to do is disassociate this. Everybody from agree, that. Um, ag agree. Think of how small science has made us uh, over the last, you know, several hundred years. You know, the, we're this insignificant ball of, of rock, you know, that's, uh, you know, been flying through space, could be taken out at any time by gamma wa waves or uh, ultraviolet radiation or solar flares. Take your or meteorites. We're, we're freaking in a shooting gallery. And that we're not even that special, you know, as far as species goes. Oh, yeah, you know, we're, we're just middle of the road. But this changes that. This means that this particular place was built for us, that it was built, you know, we are the special purpose here, that we are the reason why it was built. And, uh, you know, everyone, you know, everyone becomes accountable, everybody becomes unique. It's, it's, uh, it'd be the most fantastic thing ever. I mean, I, I, the, the wave of emotion that would come over people from a positive standpoint would be incredible to watch. Gotcha. Hey, when we come back, we're gonna have, we're gonna explore this a little bit deeper. And I actually, this is gonna be hard to do on radio, uh, but uh, what I want to do is try to get people a, a visual image of what this flat Earth model looks like. And I've got to go okay. get my dogs because they're going bananas. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna be back here in just a second. Uh, we are gonna return with Mark Sargent and more of this flat Earth debate right here on the Awakening Liberty Show on FreedomizerRadio.com. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, the number to call in is three four seven. 324-3704. Again, 347-324-3704. Stay tuned. And that was Jabba, uh, Babylon Decoded, a song that I picked up on here a couple nights ago, uh, The Earth is Flat. And uh, he's a flat earther as well. In fact, he's going to be coming up on the show August 8th, which happens to be my birthday, by the way. Uh, Jabba will be joining us uh, to talk about his viewpoints. And he's from Switzerland, and I'm really interested in talking to him. We're supposed to hook up next week. Uh, I want to know what he knows about CERN um, and some of the things that's going on in that country as well. We are talking to Mark Sargent about Flat Earth. And there's oh, so much stuff to go into here. And what I want to try to do is get an idea um, try to get a picture in people's minds. I mean, I encourage it. Definitely go check out Mark's film. If you're listening sure. in the archive, Flat Earth Clues, uh, it's right there. The link is provided for you. Um, and Or go to YouTube. And also, what was the name of your website again, Mark? Uh, it is enclosedworld.com. Gotcha. So enclosedworld.com. Go and look at yeah. some of this stuff um, because, I mean, just open your minds. You listeners, you guys, you know me, and I know you for the most part. Go out and make up your own mind. Don't parrot something you've heard like everybody's parroting what NASA has told us, like what your teacher showed us with the globe, what you see on the films and the science fiction 
Uh, they don't have any proof of this. Uh, the pictures we see, I mean, there's one picture of the globe. We have no pictures of a spinning globe. And I'll tell you, that's another big problem, Mark, for me. I, you know, I have, uh, and I've struggled with this for probably 20 years. I don't understand why you fly from Los Angeles to New York and back to New York to Los Angeles, and you have a little bit, a little tiny bit of, uh, or maybe an hour, because you're, you're flying in that, the headwind that, from jet stream. Yeah, that's the headwind, though. So, but not enough to account for the Earth spinning at a thousand miles an hour uh, right. and hurtling through space at sixty-six thousand miles an hour. It, it you know, if, if you're going to take off, I mean, why would anybody fly west? Uh, you know, basically, you're going to fly east or you're going to go west because the Earth is spinning east all the time. So, if you're going to fly, why wouldn't you go the direction that the Earth is spinning or against it? Obviously, if you're going to fly to Hawaii from Los Angeles, you should be able to take off and be there roughly in a couple hours, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. There's some interesting things when it comes to the spinning, and I didn't talk about it in the clues, but it, but it is interesting, uh, mostly because there's some math involved and and people get lost. But I will try to I'll try to do my best here, and that is look, uh, if the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles at the equator, and let's say you're flying around the equator, then if you're flying with the spin or against the spin, does gravity hold you down in both directions? Because that's what they're claiming, you know, is, is happening, that it's, it's locking you down in both directions. Therefore, you're, you're not actually uh, um, gaining anything uh, over the spin versus flying against it, which is really, really odd. But the, the better test that I like, that people, I think, that, that understand a little more clearly is, if you're spinning 1,000 miles at the equator, if, like, like you're spinning a basketball on your finger, at the North Pole or the South Pole, then you're spinning at zero miles an hour. It's like you're being at the center of a merry-go-round. You know, at the edge of a merry-go-round, you're trying to get flung off, but at the center of the merry-go-round, it's sunny skies. There's nothing happening. You're just turning in a circle. In fact, it's not even a fast circle. It's a slow circle. So the question is, centrifugal force says that it wants to, like a merry-go-round, it wants to throw you off. So why does a 100-pound weight at the North Pole weigh the same at the equator? It's a test that eventually is going to have to be proven one way or the other, but I can already tell you right now it's going to weigh exactly the same. It shouldn't, yeah, I'm not saying it's going to weigh 90 pounds at the equator because, you know, people say, well, gravity is so much stronger than centrifugal force that it's going to, you know, it's going to counteract it. I was going, yeah, but is it going to counteract it completely? Is it going to nullify centrifugal force entirely to where it weighs you know, exactly 100 pounds in both places, you're going to say, well, because gravity is counteracting uh, centri um, centrifugal force? No, no, it's, it's ridiculous. Or I'll throw even one more at you. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a good one, in my opinion. Some people disagree, and that is on a sphere in space, yes, water, it, you know, is spread, you, can be spread uniformly around a sphere, like the oceans, right? You know, it's very liquid, and uh, uh, it, it moves very, very easily. But... Here's the problem. If the ball starts spinning, then centrifugal force starts kicking in again. And you can't tell me that the oceans would not bulge around the equator uh, and get really, really thin up at the North and the South Pole. So, yeah, there's a lot of really interesting questions that we, you know, sometimes ask in grade school and junior high and whatever that, you know, the science books just smack us down and say, eh, yeah, this is, this, this is the rules. This is what we wrote. You can shut up now. And, and it's silly. Question. Yeah, question I, what, I'll, I'll, I'll throw one more out at, at your listeners, and that is because I know because I, I'm heading them off the pass here, and that is when I say, "Tell me how you know the Earth is a globe." Some people get angry, but you don't know why you're getting angry. Do you know it's a globe because you know? Because you were, you know, because you saw a, a globe in your classroom when you were six years old, and then that globe stayed with you all the way through high school and college, or do you know? because you saw the picture from 1972 that NASA showed you, because there was only one picture. So then I follow up and say, okay, how do you know it's a globe without using the word NASA? And that's usually when people get stuck. So again, it's, it's a tough thing to break out of. Look, I mean, I, I tell people, I was physically embarrassed to click on this topic last year when I was looking into it. And that's how I knew how big it was, because it was, uh, there was a visceral response. There's people that are on YouTube right now that make videos and saying flat earthers are idiots. That's their whole rebuttal. Is it flat earth is dumb, but they can't tell you why it's dumb. They just say it's dumb. And that's because of years and years of conditioning. So, and anyway, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's a reason why Obama said what he said was obviously to, to 
to uh, basically make flat earthers, you know, denigrate them, make it derogatory, make it something that they're not supposed to look at. You heard the crowd, uh, and oh, then yeah. followed by the word I, horizon, and arc. I just, I, they just blew me away. Uh, yeah. You know, here's something. I, I put this out there to anybody who's listening live. If you're a pilot, why don't you call in and and talk with us about this? I want to debate this. I want an answer to this. Uh, yeah. a, a commercial airline pilot, a military pilot, somebody who is uh, used to flying at uh, 40,000, 37,000, 40,000 feet, I want yeah. to know, and, and I have flown an airplane, and, and uh, just obviously a little Cessna, but you know, when you set your horizon out, your horizon's done, and quite frankly, yeah. everything you see out there is flat, and yeah. we didn't have to adjust our altitude to maintain our altitude, but if we're on a sphere, so you're flying at 40,000 miles, up in the air, or 40,000 feet up in the air, and you're flying on a sphere that is curving. Uh, they, some people, this is contradictory. It's about 16 feet every six miles. Yeah. It's curving that much, so 16 feet. So if you're flying along an airplane at 40,000 miles, you've got your altimeter and your artificial horizon is leveled out. You're at 30,000 feet. You're cruising altitude. And I mean, wouldn't you have to adjust continually, be dipping your nose down, to yep. accommodate for the curvature of the Earth. Otherwise, you just fly right out into space. If there's yeah, yeah, pilots out there, yeah, that's please a great call argument. in and answer that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great argument. And, and to, I'll, I'll throw one more wrinkle at it because sometimes people don't get it. It's like, look, when you're driving a car on the road, if you're on a globe, then the car hugs the curve of the, of the globe. But if you're flying in a plane, the curve doesn't make any difference the curve technically just drops below you. So yeah, like, like what Sean was saying, as soon as you start flying level, the earth will start to curve downward away from you. And that's what escape velocity is all about, is leaving the curve of the earth. And so you would constantly have to adjust your nose ever so slightly down uh, because you would keep gaining altitude. And autopilots would, you know, uh, would constantly have to do this. You would feel this as well. I mean, if you were flying in a commercial airliner, you would feel this over time. I mean, you'd feel these little, little dips every, every so often, or a big dip if they decide to space it out. So, yeah, it's a great argument. Yeah, I, to me, that I just, again, the spinning earth, um, you know, the, the guy that just did the uh, world record jump, he took off in Arizona, and uh, I guess it was about four hours to climb to 103,000 feet, I believe is where he yeah, got. Yeah, yeah, 128 roughly, 128 yeah. Roughly. Right. So it was a four-hour flight up, and then obviously he came down. Now, you would think if the Earth was spinning, now maybe Arizona, let's, let's um, I don't know the exact thing, but the equator is spinning 1,000 miles an hour. Arizona is about halfway in between, so let's say 600 miles an hour. Yeah. He's going straight up in the balloon. Now, the Earth is spinning. And by the way, when obviously the picture, if you, if you haven't seen this, go and look at the picture outside of his capsule. The horizon is completely flat until he gets to the outside shot, which is a GoPro uh, yeah. uh, camera where everything is curved. So anyway, he goes up four hours. Now, four hours times passing 600 miles an hour, the Earth is spinning to the east. He should have been over the Pacific Ocean. But now he jumps yeah. out, which apparently was another 45 minutes down, free fall and, yeah. and his chute opening. He lands 73 miles to the east. That doesn't make any sense to me. No, no, it doesn't. And, and it begs the question, I, again, uh, you know, NASA, I'd love to, how far up do you have to go? If, so, if, yeah, if he was up at a, you know, 130,000 feet, which is a pretty good clip, you know, that's as high as, as most spy planes, um, how far do you have to go before the curvature starts, starts moving away from you? You know, you'd think that it would scale <clears throat> after a certain point of time. Uh, that it's uh, you know that you would get to this point where all of a sudden then the Earth would just start spinning, uh, you know. But instead of you being locked down, but yeah, yeah, it's a great argument. I love it. Yeah, there. there uh, somebody just made a comment in the chat room. It says, uh, "Sultry, and I can deal with the Earth getting flat, but let's uh, allow women to keep their curves, please." Uh, <laughs> nice. That's, that's funny. Me up. I like that. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's try and paint a picture here because one of my big things when I explored flat Earth ten years ago, obviously I was still hooked on NASA. I thought this was the coolest thing in the world. So I was struggling with well, people can circumnavigate the globe. Okay, they're up there, they're out there sailing around. Tons of people do it. In fact, I have uh, a couple of friends who sailed their schooners around the globe. And so trying to paint a picture here of of the flat Earth model and an explanation of that. Now, if you take a CD and you put it on your desk. And you've got the hole in the center. Now, that would be the North Pole in the flat Earth model like we see in the azimuth equidistant map, correct? Yeah, yep, yep. Now, if the center is magnetic north, 
all right? Yep. You're constantly going to be navigating, obviously, away from magnetic north, so you're actually traveling in a circle, constantly going east or west, whichever way you happen to be going. You're navigating yeah. away from north, so technically you're not circumnavigating a globe. You're circling a flat plane. Yeah, yeah. That, you're just basically, you're, you're, you're taking your fork and you're drawing a circle around a dinner plate. That's all you're really doing. Uh, you're either taking a long, really long left-hand turn or a long right-hand turn. But since the distances are so vast, you'd never know. And since the North Pole is in the center of the map, the compass is going to read like it, like you would expect it to. So, yeah, it works. It's it works constantly going to be reading east or west. Yeah. Okay, so, so that, if that gives, hopefully that gives people an idea as to what this flat Earth model is. Because I, I used to throw that argument up all the time. You know, you, people circumnavigate the globe. It's got to be a globe. But yeah. when you start thinking of it flat and you start thinking of the North Pole as being the center, now you are navigating east to west, so it's actually happening. So uh, it's fascinating stuff. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk a little bit about there. Um, sure. And, in fact, I, I just misplaced my, uh, my cues here. <laughs> this happens in radio. So we've, we've talked about the authority. You know, one of the things that blew me away uh, in your yeah. video was the long-haul clue. So talk to us a little bit about the long haul clue and what that's all about. The long haul was, uh, and, and the name was, was given to me uh, by a British guy. Uh, he, he, who, he was sending me flight information uh, when, when, when he saw my early clues. But what's, what's funny is the long haul was really the first clue I could have done because that's what started me on the whole flat earth thing. And that was there was a German guy that made a, uh, a YouTube video kind of a little musical thing uh, with some text on it. I, it was all in German, but I, I kind of got the gist of it, which was that there's something wrong in the Southern Hemisphere when it comes to plane flights. And he kept saying, he's going, look, the connections are all wrong in the Southern Hemisphere. You know, the Northern Hemisphere, everything's fine. No, nobody has any problems. But in the Southern Hemisphere, when you try to fly specifically from anywhere in, really in South America to anywhere near Australia, the plane flights take these weird, weird connections uh, well, first, you can't even find nonstops between some of the major cities. I mean, capital cities, uh, in, you know, in uh, near Australia and uh, South America. But if you can find uh, non, well, okay, let me back up. But the connections, so most of them are connections, but they're connecting all over the place. So, for example, you'd go from, say, uh, Buenos Aires to Sydney, Australia, right? And those flights will take the weirdest routes. It should be just a 12-hour shot across the South Pacific Ocean, you know, because you're, you're you know, on a globe, you can take the, the shortest route, which is, you know, one ocean, one, you know, one airspace. It'd be a piece of cake, you know. You have to deal with a few things in South America, but it's, a, it's literally a straight shot across an ocean. And they don't. They never take that route. They always go to somewhere like in the Middle East. Or what's weirder is when they'll connect you, like, if you, again, if you're going from Buenos Aires to Sydney, why they will connect you through San Francisco or Los Angeles or Dallas and double the distance that you would normally travel. Why would you spend, so instead of a 12-hour flight, and you guys can look this up anytime you want, these flights will average 20-something hours, 30 hours. I was seeing some that were pushing 50, 51 hours to get from South America to Australia, which is ridiculous. There's, you, it doesn't take three days to get anywhere. But it does in this case, and it didn't make sense. And so I'm looking, and then all of a sudden I start plotting the, uh, the flights like uh, the guy from um, um, England was telling me, which was, he goes, look at it on a flat map, and all of a sudden the flights straighten out. It, from Buenos Aires to Sydney, Australia, if you're going through San Francisco, it becomes a straight line. So how did you know how to connect through San Francisco to make it a straight line? The odds of that happening are way out of bounds. And as I was staring at it, I was realizing that, yeah, this would be one of the things. It's one of the things you can't hide. If the map is wrong, if the map, it is, if it is not a globe, if it, was, if it is a flat map, then the flights, you can't hide the flights. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can mask them best, the best you can, but on a flat map, there are no shortcuts. So you have to try to disguise them. So you make a whole bunch of connections. So 95% of the flights in the Southern Hemisphere are connections, which should raise, you know, some alarm bells anyway. But the ones that aren't, uh, you know, there's, so people kept saying, and I'll, I'll, I'll bleed into the other video, which was Clue 9, which was the magic show, because people were, were, were sending me stuff and they were saying, well, no, I found a connection, therefore the flat earth must be wrong. So I started staring at it. I was going, okay, how can there be uh, a nonstop uh, flight in the Southern Hemisphere? 
and then I was watching these planes, and then I saw it, and that was the GPS system. Uh, and again, you can look it up on planefinder.net or FlightAware or Flight Tracker or whatever you want, because they all use the same system. And by the way, the GPS system is the United States military. It went online in 1995. They turn you guys, off the Department of Defense. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, Department of Defense. Uh, they turn off the uh, the tracking in the Southern Hemisphere to where when you get offshore off of South America or Australia, wherever, as soon as you go across the ocean, maybe 100, 150, 200 miles, you get dropped from the GPS system entirely. Your plane does not exist. And it stays invisible off the system, off the grid, until about an hour before touchdown where it magically appears, and then it lands and everybody's happy. And the reason why they do that is they don't want to show you the route it actually took. Because they show you the route, it's going to look really screwy, and you're going to start questioning the map. And uh, it, that was amazing to watch. That was just I just lucked out, you know, watching watching all these flights in the southern hemisphere disappear. And uh, yeah, it's uh, so, so. Let me get this right. You actually you actually use FlightTracker.com, and you were actually tracking flights. And now now it's some distance off of the so let's say they're coming out of Sydney, and some distance off of the coast, uh, yeah. the GPS completely turned off. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the flight, it, it completely drops off. It literally visually drops off the, off the map. And then when you look at the individual plane, the plane, even though it's still flying, says it's going into either uh, approximate mode or estimated mode, which is, um, which is unheard of. And it stays there. Now, what was interesting, and I didn't necessarily talk about this in the clues, was I said that it's being turned off, but there was a whole bunch of people that came to me and said, you know what, I don't think it's being turned off. I think it's being, it, I don't think there's coverage. Which mean, and that would make sense because if you have to, if you question satellites in a flat map, <clears throat> the GPS system, which of course stands for Global Positioning System, which means there shouldn't be any gaps, would have potentially large gaps in the Southern Hemisphere, and that's what we we seem to be looking at. The, there there is no coverage. Again, pull up PlaneFinder.net, look in the those three oceans: the the South Pacific, the South Atlantic, and the Indian Oceans. There's no planes. It but is, but we got planes good. flying over the we got we got planes flying in the northern hemisphere. That flight tracker, I looked at it. We've got planes flying across the ocean, but there are none. I've seen this, folks. Go and look it up yeah. yourself. Don't take our word for it. Go do your own research and start to critically think. There's planes flying across in the northern hemisphere, and they're being tracked. Correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's the northern hemisphere is perfectly fine. Yeah, they're not they're not flying the routes they probably should be because again, the map's wrong. But in the southern hemisphere, it's, it's completely empty, and it goes against everything that we know. I mean, the whole point of the global positioning system is that it has complete global coverage. But they'll be the first ones. You know, there will be people that have already emailed them, and they say, oh, yeah, we've got, we've got some problems in the southern hemisphere. But they won't say why exactly. You know, they give you the runaround. But you can't tell me I, – I, I said this in, in one of the videos. I said, look – you can't tell me that an American system isn't going to track American tourists because, you know, we do a lot of tourism down in South America and Australia. You're, you're telling me we're not going to track American citizens? Yeah, that, a bunch of crap. Of course we are. We're, we're the American government. We spend money on all sorts of ridiculous stuff. We are absolutely right. going to track them, but we don't. So, yeah, Mario I, in, in the chat room. Go ahead. Yeah, Mario in the chat room made the same observation that I did. We've got a lot of planes that have been disappearing, obviously Malaysian Airlines. Um, these are planes that have GPS systems on them. There are planes that have, you know, we can't, we can't even find the, the black boxes or the pingers. Um, and this cost, very, could possibly be an explanation as to why these planes are disappearing with no trace. I don't know if it's yeah. aliens or whatever. Yeah, but yeah. It the, seems the to me. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, the Malaysian flights, no question, were, were not on the system when they went down. And it was kind of funny that they brought it up. I think there was, there was a mistake made there, which was, uh, you know, the, there were questions that came up about the GPS system, but nobody really latched on to it. Had I gotten these clues out earlier before the Malaysian things sort of happened, uh, I think we, they would have paid more attention to it because it would have been more uh, fresh, fresh in people's heads. But yeah, yeah, there's no there's no question. You, know, you don't you can't lose a freaking flagship plane. It's 2015. No. You know, you don't lose a 777 in the middle of it, middle it wasn't even that far. It wasn't in the middle of the nowhere. It was just in the Indian Ocean. It, it, planes don't get lost like that. But but they do now. Again, you want to watch lost planes, just go on plane finder. They they get lost every hour. Yeah, planes hit buildings and you can't see them anymore. So I you know, ah, I don't know. We're being lied. 
We're being lied to about everything, folks, and it's time to start waking up to what's happening. You know, they, they, they trick us with the Federal Reserve. It is nothing federal. It's no more federal than Federal Express. They trick us with 9-11, which, in my opinion, was a theatrical Hollywood production, and they fooled everybody. Uh, obviously, there's no planes that found at the towers. There's no plane found in Shanksville. There's no plane at the Pentagon. They lying to us about everything. The lies are just off the hook. They are outrageous. So um, you kind of start looking at some of this stuff. Now, let me ask you another question. And sure. again, this goes back to me. Um, you know, it, it seems like every year, and I've watched this for about five years, and I gave up because every year I heard that somebody was going to try to attempt a north to south. 360 degree circumnavigation of the globe. Every year, one or two of them pop up, and there's a little sizzle video, and that somebody says they're going to try and do it, and every single one of them has been unsuccessful. They never even make the trip, so it's like this little breadcrumb they keep throwing out there. And so nobody, nobody's done this, folks. Look it up. Nobody has ever flown over the North Pole or circumnavigated the globe north to south. This is a huge problem for me. Now, secondly, if you're if you're going to leave, uh, let's say the tip of South America, and you want to fly to South Africa, yeah, just like we fly over the North Pole, and we all talk about that, we can sit there and have cocktails and fly over the North Pole. Yeah. Isn't the shortest distance obviously between the southern tip of South America and South Africa to fly right over Antarctica? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And those flights were stopped. Decades ago, um, there was a, and I, you'll have to forgive me because I, I haven't memorized the name of this one, but there was a flight in the 70s that supposedly crashed into some mountains in Antarctica, and after that, they completely banned flights from, any commercial flights from, from really going anywhere near Antarctica. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. The shortest distance between two points on a globe would be to fly over Antarctica, but they don't do them anymore. And they just kind of gloss over it now. You know, you go through a whole bunch of hoops and red tape when, when you try to dig into this. But, but yeah, yeah, it's, 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 again, one of those weird, weird things. And honestly, I was surprised they, they let flights anywhere near that place anyway, even if they skirted the edge, because that would mean, you know, it would make more work for the Antarctic Defense Force. Right. Yeah, and, I, you know, I, I, I wonder, you know, if, I wonder if any of those flights ever occurred. Those were just, uh, yeah. you know, obviously, you know, nobody's on the plane. The plane wasn't even in the air. Uh, I, yeah. You know, I find that kind of interesting because obviously it, it, it hasn't been done. So I got a lot of questions yeah. about that, too. It's just, it's very, very strange to me. Um, you know, it almost sounds to me like the plane that crashed, it probably hit the uh, side of the uh, snow globe, right? There you go. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's always that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, good point. I've, you know, and I've, it's funny, I've been looking, like I said, I've, my, my brain has been wrapped around this for two months now, and I'm all these thought experiments, and I'm just actually been, the dribbles are running around in my head going nuts, and then I started looking at a snow globe, and I'm going, wow, you know, where, where did that toy come from? <laughs> so it, 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 it just, I asked a bunch of questions about it, and like I said, I, I've got problems with the, the global spinning, or like spinning definitely, I've got problems now that I'm, I'm trying to figure out and rectify in my head, things like the Coriolis effect. And let me yeah. ask you this, Mark. I mean, one of the things I've been watching in the sky for the last three days is mm -hmm. I've seen all these models where the sun is basically chasing the moon, and they're kind of they're in a synchronous orbit. They're right opposite of each other. And yeah. that they're actually rotating around us. We're not rotating. This isn't heliocentric. We're talking about geocentricity here. So we're not moving, we're on a flat earth, and they are actually very close to us. They're not 93 million miles away or 240,000 miles away. And yeah. they're traveling in this sequential circular orbit. Now, yeah. I'm looking up at the sky the last three days, and I've got the sun and the moon in the sky at the same time. And, yeah. uh, and actually, today was really weird because they were almost at the same altitude. So, yeah, um, you, there were several, several people posted videos on that today. Good, good, good catch. Where, where yeah, the, in I, fact, it was a half, it was a half moon, but the sun was right, was opposed to it, and you're looking at it, it's like, why would it be a half moon when they're when they seem to be like right there, you know, right across? Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Right, and, and actually, what you're what you're saying there really touched me too because yesterday the half moon looked so fake. I mean, it was a perfect line. Uh, there was no blend. There was no nothing. It was just a perfect line. It looked like a pie in the sky that cut. Um, was very strange looking to me, and even today was very strange. And I, I, that's interesting that other people photographed this today because I kept looking at it with the show, obviously, and I'm going, what in the world? So I started thinking of some other models, whether these things are actually in, in spirals 
if they're yeah. they're on some sort of spiral circular orbit and they're changing their distances or changing their altitudes. Or the other thing that came up to me was, and I I got to get an animation program because I want to mess around with this. Was the yin yang? Maybe these things are traveling oh, yeah, in the, the yin yang around us. The yin yang symbol is perfect when you lay it on top of a flat Earth map. It is so eerie that the yeah that the moon travels around one you know one circle circular path and the sun the other. It's uh, it's brilliant. And where how old is that symbol? Uh, you know, you wonder what they knew. I said the same thing to my wife today, I, I, and another friend of mine. We were at a barbecue, and I said, I "Wonder what these guys knew." I mean, obviously something was going on. So, um, yeah. anyway, I got a few more things I want to go to, and I encourage anybody out there just call in if you got any questions for Mark. I mean, I think he's laid it out here. Um, I have become a skeptic of the global uh, heliocentric model, um, big time at this point, and li I'm like you, Mark. I didn't want to look at this, um, yeah. and but again, I I, I wouldn't be. You know, I do this because I'm looking for truth. I'm always a student, and uh, you know, I encourage everybody out there to check into this, look into it, and just start asking the questions. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to talk about Jaronism and his uh, laser test that just happened here recently. And I guess there's another one coming up. I'm going to get your feedback on that. Um, so sure. please call in 347-324-3704. 347-324-3704. We are going to open up the phone line. So call in if you have any questions. Um, please be respectful. We know this is a, a, not a taboo, but it's definitely a controversial subject. But please be respectful if you have questions. Please do call in and uh, we'll get you on the air right away. So uh, stay tuned. And welcome back to the Awakening Liberty Show right here on the freedomizerradio.com network. And yeah, that was me busting out a little rap over a funky groove. So um, I have a lot of fun with doing some of these ads and recording stuff for people. We're talking to Mark Sargent. And uh, we're talking about flat Earth, and we were talking about the debate, and and you know why this has gained so much traction. I want to I want to bring up here um, the curvature of the Earth because there are lots of people now actually trying to uh, justify this and actually measure this curvature that they say we have um, based yeah. on mathematical principles. Obviously, looking at the sun, trying to figure out where it is, um, and the Pythagorean theorem. We should be able to, based on the globe, which is roughly twenty seven thousand miles. Uh, we, sh yeah. we should be able to use the Pythagorean theorem to determine how much drop and how much curvature there is. Yeah. And, and I'm going to point out here real quick before we talk about Jaronism's laser test. Uh, uh, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson has recently been on the Discovery Channel, the History Channel, the Science Channel, the Learning Channel, whatever. And he recently said that uh, you know the Earth really is quasi-spherical. It's not really a sphere. It's a pear-shaped. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I'm surprised they even let him say that because all of a sudden that begs the question, wait a minute, every picture I have seen of the, the, the world, the spherical globe, is a sphere. It's a perfect sphere. I mean, <laughs> what is, did that yeah, make down, any sense yeah. to you? No, no, down, down to the pixel. It's, it's a sphere, yeah. It's a perfect sphere. Yeah, that, that quote is going to haunt Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, till his dying day because, yeah, when he came, when he did that, uh, that little, I think it was a college lecture tour, and he said that, yeah, it's an oblate spheroid and that it's more pear-shaped, you know, that it's heavier in the bottom than it is in the top. And it's like, okay, then why was the only photo that we ever saw a perfect sphere? Why is Google Earth an absolute perfect sphere? Why was this photo that was just taken four days ago? Why is that a perfect sphere? And, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely going to come back to haunt him. Uh, you know, hopefully he and I won't meet because that, that question will come up uh, eventually. Yeah, and most definitely. And I guess it's a 24-hour time lapse they show us of the world, the world spinning, um, but the clouds don't move at all. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, the, only, the only record that we have of the Earth rotating on its axis is supposedly from the 1990, 90, uh, you know, that's 20, 25 years ago, uh, the Galileo, and that's not even technically a movie. It was supposedly just a bunch of still shots that were stitched together. But Matt Boylan figured it out almost immediately, you know, because he had an artist's eye, and he goes, look, here's 24 hours, but the weather isn't changing. The clouds aren't morphing. When does that happen? And then, of course, when they, they did a little zoom-in shot where they didn't show any rotation, but then they show some weather morphing. But, they, but that's because in 1990, it was way too tough to simulate with the special effects technology that they had at the time. So, and even now, it's almost impossible to do. And even with the camera, I mean, you're talking about 
the planet moving at 66,000 miles around the sun. Uh, the uh, Galileo mission was traveling some 30, 40,000 miles an hour. Um, and then, obviously, we're, we're the whole galaxy or the whole solar system is moving in the galaxy at... I, I can't remember what they say. Some, you know, oh yeah, massive amount. Hundred three million miles a second. So there's all this movement. There's all this torque. There's all these, and they've got a camera on the Earth from, and I think uh, Galileo was uh, out some four hundred thousand miles or something like that. Yeah, uh, and yeah. that doesn't make any sense to me either. Um, how, I mean, how are they going to get a picture? It actually, uh, it, that didn't make any sense. Jaronism. Yeah. yeah. I Jaronism. I really Good encourage guy. people to go check out Jaronism. J E R a N I S M Jaronism. Yeah, yeah. Y yes. yes. Go on YouTube and look at the Jaronism test. Okay, he's actually out there uh, using a laser test. The first one didn't go so well. The second one, they kind of changed it up a little bit. He did a yeah. four-mile stretch across the Monterey Bay, and the cameraman could see the laser on the paper, um, a one inch above sea level. Now, over four miles, that doesn't make any sense. He shouldn't have seen anything below six feet. So they did not measure any curvature at all. Um, and I challenge people, here's what Rob Skiba, you know who Rob Skiba is, right? I, I know Rob, yeah. Okay. You know, Rob is challenging people, and I'm going to put this out there too. You know, go out and get yourself a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood and paint 1 foot, 2 foot, 3 foot, and I'm going to actually do this out in the Black Rock Desert out here. And, uh, and, and get yourself a, a $30, $40 telescope and go out 6 miles, measure it out, make sure your elevations are right, and see if you can actually see any curvature of the Earth. Um, you know, what, I'm, we're, we're starting to see that people are not measuring this curvature. I mean, what do you think of that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, there's some tests. Uh, I just interviewed a guy um, uh, a couple days ago, uh, Jeffrey Grupp, uh, G-R-U-P-P. -P. But he just put up a video this morning, which is just amazing. He goes into the refraction, whereas, yeah, there's no curvature. And, and he goes into some great details of an hour-long video but it's called uh, Flat Earth Volume 1, The Chicago Skyline. You know, light refraction and the illusion of curvature. And basically what he's showing is he's going, look, there is no curvature. He goes, there is refraction only. And he can prove it. And, and it's a brilliant, you know, you've got you to concentrate. You've got to watch the video and, and don't skip and go get a sandwich or anything. But it's worth the watch because by the time you get to the end of it, between that and the Jaronism test and the other people that are doing stuff, no, there does not appear to be any curvature at all anywhere and uh it's it's really great and i hope to do some tests of my own here pretty soon uh, we all got to get together and, and do a round table and bring some of these people to the table that seemingly to me uh mark i gotta throw this out there it seems to me from what i know about eric dupe what i know about matt ball and these guys are not religious they don't believe in god they're kind of new agers um yeah and yeah. my my instincts tell me that uh, that's kind of why they're bashing you it's kind of why they're bashing rob skiba um, because he's grounded in Scripture. And in case you don't know this, folks, Scripture talks about a flat earth. Um, it, well, that mentions it as a circle. Um, they give it a oh, word yeah, to yeah. Paul. And, yeah. and uh, it talks about the, the sun and the moon being inside the firmament, water above, water below, and the four corners of the earth. Well, for a sphere, there's no four corners. Go look yeah. this stuff up. And uh, Mark, thank you for being on the show. I'm running out of time oh, here. Thank so, you. Oh, no, I know, uh, I know, but thank you very much. Yeah, we, we need to do this again. And I, I, there's a couple people I want to introduce you to and uh, um, get, get some other... I mean, I'd love to get you, Rob Skiba, Jeff Hayes, who wrote Rise of the New World Order, The Calling of Man. Um, you know, yeah. I've had Marshall Masters on, who's a Planet Xer. And by the way, you know, if we are not a heliocentric model, this whole Planet X thing's a ruse from the Illuminati, as uh, yep. far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> yep, that's, I uh, think it's it, a ruse, yeah. Yeah, I think it uh, brings that really into question, and you know, who knows? They may project something in the sky to cause mass panic and then impose martial law, take all of our rights go. and liberties away, vaccinate everybody so that they can depopulate. I don't know what's really going on, but that's what I'm trying to find out here on this show. I'm investigating. I'm talking to people. Mark, thanks again so much for being on the show. Would you come back? Oh, I'd be happy to come back. You just let me know. All right, Mark. I appreciate it. You have a great night, okay? All right. You too, Sean. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Folks, i got to wrap it up here. Um, an amazing interview with Mark. I definitely recommend you go and check out Flat Earth Clues on YouTube. Just go watch it and start to critically think. Start to ask your own questions. There are things that I'm having issues with that I can't rectify yet, um, and there are experiments yet to be done, um, and there are people all over the globe now going, wait a minute, something is very wrong. 
And the one question, just start with this one question, why we've never circumnavigated the globe north to south. Something is wrong. Okay? Why is there a treaty in place that doesn't allow you and I, the 99 percenters, to go down there and see what's there? Why are the governments that are involved all involved in the Illuminati banking families? Why are they doing this? My gut instinct tells me that they found evidence of God or intelligent design. Whether it's God, aliens, whatever. For me, it's God. And we've all got to wake up to the lies that are being told. We are being manipulated. We are being deceived. It's absolutely necessary that we come together as humanity because time's running short. The lies are getting bigger and they, are, they actually know, and I feel in my heart they're getting scared because people are starting to wake up, higher consciousness, God, whatever. He's telling us, look, it's time to wake up, people. Tell your family, tell your friends. And as Mark said in his video, we didn't get to this, the number one thing about Flat Earth is don't talk about Flat Earth. Think about it like Fight Club. Okay? Just give them tidbits. Ask them questions like, you know, why are the planes in the Southern Hemisphere not being tracked on GPS? Why is wealth being hidden in Antarctica? You know, we've got somebody that said there's more uranium down there and coal and enough to supply the world for hundreds and hundreds of years. Why are we not down there? Why are the corporations not down there? Why are the governments that are involved down there all in the space program and all trying to fake... Okay, folks, that's the second time when I'm talking about the Illuminati, I'm talking about the truth, and that's the second time my phone dropped off tonight. Just actually stayed connected, but blog talk kicked me off the air. So anyway, I got to go. I'm out of time. I'm going to go ahead and play a brief broadcast for you. Um, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in, and I hope you're listening to the archives. And uh, just check this out. I mean, like I said, I'm not convinced yet, um, but I have more questions about the theory of a spinning globe hurtling through space than I do about the possibility that the Earth is flat. So go and check it out yourself. It's not just about, I mean, like I said, it's about breaking the matrix. Um, it's very, very important that we do this. I want to, blessings to all, and uh, everybody have a great night. Um, and thanks for tuning in to the Awakening Liberty Show. I will see you next week with a stack of truth that will blow your mind. Thanks again. Bye-bye now.